Uh, yeah, thanks for hosting me. And I should also say in advance before I forget, uh, thanks to Tom Cochran over at Flinders and thanks to Dawn Wilson. If what I say is in any way intelligible, it's partly because they let me ramble on through some of these ideas uh, in conversation recently. So, OK, so there were a couple of departs from the abstract. Originally, I'd wanted to do a paper that was very much about eligibility and really inscrutability arguments. Um, I was going to do more depth on those because I was quite excited about it. But I realized that having some uh, respondents at my disposal, it would probably be better to offer a more superficial buffet of considerations. And the, the central idea here is going to be that um, there are use external semantic forces, like meta-semantic forces, that we need to kind of take into account when we're doing metaphysics of art and probably other bits of art as well, other sort of art inquiries. OK, so I'm going to open up with a little opinionated bit of my bugbears about art metaphysics. These may be inaccurate, they may be caricature, they may be misleading, but um, Here's what I say anyway, and I might be corrected. So, um, so here's how I go. Inquiry into art metaphysics isn't stagnant. Uh, old views are frequently dismissed and radical replacements were proposed. But it isn't flourishing either. The replacements rarely stick. And there's little sense the inquiry progresses in a direction. Uh, nothing's getting built. Um, now, some have kind of tried to fix this by saying we should be more sensitive to practice, uh, maybe give greater evidential weight to practice, um, get more detailed information from practice. Um, that might be that might be a good thing, though there is there's a minor worry about overfitting data. When you've got noisy data, getting a very close uh, account of the data can actually be dangerous. It can sort of fail to project or fail to issue in good predictions. But I'm more concerned about other features. Um, one thing is that the, the sort of art metaphysical inquiry seems insulated from concerns in general metaphysics, epistemology and logic, as well as the, the sciences, although some people do talk about the, the sciences a fair bit. Um, the other issue is that while the inquiry seems to have explanatory ambitions, uh, those ambitions are sort of channeled into a kind of internalistic, conceptual looking project. This is a bit of a caricature, I think, but basically we, we get some intuitions that are set out. We find a view is incompatible with some of the intuitions and we reject them. And then we kind of bring in like a new theory. That seems to be most of art metaphysics. There's very little comparison of um, theoretical virtues like strength, um, in, a, in, a, in an applied case like art metaphysics, you think that compatibility with plausible background would also be important um, and simplicity. They just don't seem to turn up with much, doesn't seem to be much attention paid to these sorts of considerations. And when I sort of started out my um, grad studies, this was sort of around 2009, 2010, when there was a kind of meta metaphysical or meta ontological revolution going on. And I was reading the stuff from the mainstream tradition, which is largely Lewis inspired. And it was a little bit like, you know, these, these, seem, these people seem to be building something. They seem to have some degree of um, coherence in the way these, these inquiries were conducted. Uh, so it was a little bit like when I was kind of going back to my sort of ontology of art, um, it was a little bit like being a sort of orphan looking in at a family that's having Christmas dinner. You know, you sort of see that scene in a film sometimes. You sort of, you think they're, they're, they're kind of all together helping each other out art metaphysics seems to be quite um, disparate. And um, so what I thought, what I wanted to do for a while, and I sort of thought someone else might have already done it, but I, I'm not seeing much evidence that's, that's the case. Um, I want to explore a sort of art application of the, the mainstream tradition that's, that stems from Lewis and is kind of furthered up through the likes of John Schaffer and Ted Sider nowadays. Okay. And like I say, the key issue in for today's talk is going to be we're looking for a general sort of push, a general sort of current that's going to push us towards accepting a use external notion of eligibility. Right. OK, here's a layout. We're going to kind of cover uh, metaphysics, epistemology and metasemantics or broadly philosophical logical concerns. Uh, don't worry too much about the details. They'll all be relatively superficial. So there'll just be like opening gambits for each. OK, so. Here's, an, here's what I think an optimistic art realist thinks. This is someone not beset by um, skepticism or really detailed worries or 
some super minimalist kind of metaphysics. Um, I, I've put in red the words that I think people might sort of seize upon and sort of think they're a bit dodgy and, and they might be right. And I'd, I'd be happy to sort of hear comments about that. So an optimistic art realist, um, they accept that there are objective facts about art in some sense of objective. Um, they think that art words and, and names and predicates, but I'm gonna be focusing today mostly on predicates and properties. Um, art words uh, refer, they have reference. Um, also, there are substantive facts or sentences or questions about art. So it's not a matter of, um, it's not always a matter of say, we're talking about concepts or terms or we're engaged in metalinguistic negotiation when we ask questions about art. Um, some art inquiries, and these, these, these can go from every day, the sorts of inquiries I conduct to what a specialist um, art theorist might kind of be involved in, and then the philosophical, including the sort of metaphysical. I think some of these inquiries have explanatory ambitions. They're, they're looking to explain facts. I also um, think that art, we shouldn't be uh, methodologically exceptional about art metaphysics. If you're already a kind of some sort of naturalist, say, or something like that, you shouldn't change your mind and go, well, actually, I'm a Carnapian sort of framework theorist just for art. It just seems like a really weird thing to do. Okay, so I'm thinking, I'm just adding here at the bottom, I'm thinking that if you, if you are that sort of art realist, you're probably going to, I'm not really going to argue for it, but I'm thinking you're probably best off with a plenitudinous ontology. That's where artworks are drawn from. And you're probably going to want an abundant stock of properties. You're going to want properties corresponding to, you know, any predicate that can apply. Um, and as it turns out, uh, Elion Lewis, who has a kind of very semantic focus, uh, in, in radical contrast with Armstrong, who's his kind of chief sort of sparring buddy of that era. You know, Armstrong is uh, chiefly concerned with the properties in uh, physics, whereas Lewis is kind of much more eclectic in what he'll sort of allow uh, into, his, into his ontology and ideology. So Lewis is accepting the existence of a plenitude of objects um, and abundant attributes to give basically truth conditions for claims. And since you know, speakers might carve the world up into in weird ways with individuals and properties, he has an individual for every filled region of space time, and he has a property for every set of possibilia. Okay, so they're gonna be massively plenitudinous and abundant. Here's what he says, because we're working on properties mostly today. And um, here's what he says about properties. Any class of things, be it ever so gerrymandered and miscellaneous and indescribable in thought and language, and be it ever so superfluous in characterizing the world is nevertheless a property. So there are properties in immense abundance. And it, it looks like he's got at least for intentional. We're, we're just, we're gonna forget about hyper-intentional kind of languages. We're just gonna stick with the intentionals for now. So it looks like he's got enough to get pretty much any sort of truth conditions you want. But what the abundant properties give us in semantic terms, they take us away in metaphysical ones. So abundant properties famously don't discharge metaphysical roles. And one is explaining genuine similarities, right? Here's what he says. Uh, because properties are so abundant, they are indiscriminating. Any two things share infinitely many properties and fail to share infinitely many others. That is so whether two things are perfect duplicates or utterly dissimilar. Thus properties do nothing to capture facts of resemblance or causal powers of things. And we'll talk about causal powers in a, in a moment. Um, properties carve reality at the joints and everywhere else as well. Okay, so that's the abundant properties. Uh, here's a kind of little worked example that kind of Ted Sider sort of offers, quite a nice one. So you've got to, you, what I'm going to do is just offer triples, right? So here's an electron at location one, electron at location two, and a cow at location three. Now it looks like we want the electrons to go together. We want that to be something to do with sharing properties in a way that the cow um is excluded from that's one of the jobs for that's one of the metaphysical jobs for properties to do but since there's an abundant property for any predicate that can be cooked up like no matter how disjunctive we'll find that each electron shares infinitely many properties with the cow and diverges from the other electron with respect to infinitely many properties too so i mean ted sider does this a lot more rigorously but we've got here here's some predicates 
Uh, is it location one or location three? It's electron one in the cow, they've kind of got that. Is it location two or location three? That's the second electron. Is it, is it location one or more than one kilogram in mass? So that's the first electron and the, the cow. Um, is it location three or less than one kilogram in mass? So the cow and yeah, the electron, so on and so forth, right? Get the idea. So Lewis uh, in the, I think Lewis initially is aiming to avoid uh, positing uh, anything more substantial than, than the abundant properties, but he is eventually brought round, I think chiefly by these considerations about similarity. And he introduces a new primitive and he doesn't introduce primitives lightly. Um, so to solve the problem, Lewis introdu introduces what he calls an elite minority of special properties, call these the perfectly natural properties. Natural properties would be the ones whose sharing makes for resemblance and the ones relevant to causal powers. Uh, these properties are sometimes said in the popular metaphor, they carve nature at the joints and not everywhere else as well, I suppose. Um, and I just add, just add a quick note that Lewis also deploys perfect naturals in analyzing notions of duplication and intrinsicness, which are issues that are kind of a little bit fraught in the, the philosophy of art. I might come back to that later at this time. Um, now, just, just an important, and a, a sort of second important note is that the naturalness of a property is a feature not determined by our use. It's sort of out there in the property itself. It's intrinsically, you know, intrinsically natural. Or whatever. Um, now, obviously, for, at the moment, the naturals are just a placeholder, right? There's no sort of real substance, there's no sort of real flesh put on this. But given Lewis's other sort of commitments, so on the one hand, he's a kind of ontological naturalist. He sort of believes in the deposits of the sciences and privileges them over other posits. He's also a, um, he also believes in a humane supervenience thesis. So he takes the macro level facts to supervene on the micro level stuff. So it's unsurprising, Lewis's perfect naturals are identified with microphysical properties. And then he imagines the rest of the stuff being built up out of the mosaic, right? These. Okay. But here's a kind of interesting sort of case. I think that the you can run those sorts of triples for art cases too. Um, so here we've got here we've got some triples. So we've got uh, Dora Maar, Dora Maar Osha, and the Eroica Symphony. It looks to me like the first two belong together in a way that they don't with the second. Um, I I imagine some people might worry about trans kind cases like that, where you're going from painting to to, to musical works. I, I'm not sure what the the rationale would be, but maybe that's something that someone would say. But I would say sort of Dora Maar, Dora Maar Osha, and Primavera. Right, they seem to be, it seems like the, the two Picassos go together in a way Primavera doesn't go with them. I also think, I mean, this is, this is unnecessary for what I'm doing today, but I think these kind of, these things also project out to further sorts of, well, properties or types of art. So I think the few or the property of being a few and the canon or the property of being canon are more similar to each other than is the tone poem. The, sorry, more so to each other than either is to the tone poem. Very different sorts of, um, different kinds or different properties that, 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 that look like they're, they're grouping, uh, reflect something about similarities of those properties. Um, and maybe practices too. So I think maybe oil painting and non-cast sculpture are maybe a bit more similar than musical composition is. You know, one's notational might be an important sort of uh, joint here. And I'm just sort of thinking that a Lewisian art metaphysi metaphysician might desire a use external notion like naturalness to, to, to sort of illuminate or to put a certain glow on the similarity making art properties, okay? So there's an obvious problem here, which is that the perfect naturals that Lewis introduces his microphysical uh, naturals, it doesn't look like they overlap substantially with the properties um, ascribed in art. Um, so we might wonder what's the sort of, what is this kind of realist Lewisian going to say about the art case? Although I would, one thing that I did sort of think earlier was maybe there might be some overlap in some really basic sorts of properties, but certain symmetries and so on. But, but we'll leave that for now. Um, here's a few, here's a few, I'm not going to follow up any of these, but here are a few sort of ways that the, the art realist might resist, uh, might resist Lewis's microphysicalism. So she might adopt a kind of theory relativism about perfect naturals. Um, 
this is recent, well, relatively recently um, floated by Taylor. I think it's Charles Taylor, but it it has sort of elements that might be reminiscent of Putnam and Goodman's approaches. They don't go for a sort of monolithic kind of. There's one sort of thing. They've got like pluralisms and things going on. I don't really understand that sort of stuff, but but it seems to me like that might be a way to go. On the other hand, um, Jonathan Schaffer has quite an interesting reply to Lewis. He kind of worries about the possibility that there isn't a ground level, right? So, and he thinks that, you know, our microphysics, however far down we get, it's never going to be, you know, it's not going to be in the top half, right? Because of, the, you know, the nature of infinite sort of descent. Um, so he sort of says, well, you know, we introduce perfect naturals to kind of accommodate similarity and, and we'll talk about causal powers. And he says, well, look, special sciences, he thinks they, they pick up resemblances and similarities and causal powers. And if there isn't really a ground level, it seems weird that you're going to privilege microphysics over, over um, the properties of, say, psychology or, or maybe semantics or something like that. So he sort of says, well, why not be an egalitarian about, about naturalness and have, have, have naturals drawn from every, every layer of reality? Um, and I would actually say um, here, you might want to restrict that to say art, you might want to restrict it to art inquiries that have some degree of explanatory success, right, as well. And I think there's just an interesting paper that doesn't get mentioned a lot by Dagfin Folstall, where he sort of takes hermeneutics to be um, just basically an inference of the best explanation. And so it's quite an interesting paper, given some of the things that turn up in, in this talk. Or on the other hand, here's the, the sort of Williams, well, sort of Williams borrowed bit from Williams, um, Robbie Williams, that is. Um, you can argue that there might be, there might be emergent universals that you might use as your artistic perfect naturals, and they'll, they'll define the sets that, that, that you want for your, your perfect naturals. So they seem like three goers, you know, potentially. Um, they're probably not going to fit Lewis or Cider or the kind of orthodox tradition, but, you know, they might be worth following up. The way that I'm going to go is by following what Lewis seems to leave out for us, which is a kind of, um, he introduces degrees of naturalness. So we've got perfect naturals at the ground level. Um, but that doesn't, you know, there's plenty of properties are going to be somewhat natural, natural to some degree. Uh, here's how he puts it. Um, some few properties are perfectly natural. Others, even though they may be somewhat disjunctive or extrinsic, are at least somewhat natural in a derivative way, to the extent that they can be reached by not too complicated chains of definability from the perfectly natural properties. The colours, as we know, are inferior in naturalness to such perfectly natural properties as mass or charge or probably spin nowadays, I guess. But, but you know, you get the idea. Um, now, Lewis here appeals to definability. That's kind of questionable. It's, it's unclear whether definability is really the right relation between properties at all, and whether definability is just too strong a requirement. But I think there's some sort of intuitive pull to the idea that there's a distance from the ground level, right? Whether it's characterizing supervenience or grounding or something like that. The idea that reality, the, the properties of reality are kind of arranged into different layers is kind of, I think there's some plausibility to that. Um, and with art, I guess the thought is you could sort of try to account for the, the genuine artistic similarities by appeal to sharing of the most fundamental art properties. That is the ones that are closest to Lewis's microphysical naturals. Um, and I just mentioned like as a little sort of um, curiosity in the literature, Lewisians, people like uh, David Lewis and Ted Sider, as they move beyond the ground level and they get, say, past anything like chemistry, all of a sudden they just start conflating all the levels together. They just sort of assume that all these things are kind of on the same level. So there's a little bit just in passing where David Lewis says, by the time we get to cats, pencils and puddles, as if cats, pencils and puddles are sort of all sitting at the same level from the, from the ground level. Um, and Sider sort of, without a ton of argument, sort of takes um, bodily and psychological identity criteria for persons to be sort of equinatural and without kind of much argument. But at any rate, that's just a curiosity, but it might it indicate a lacuna. There's like a bit where the mainstream Lewisians haven't really followed up with the, the artistic sorts of cases. Okay. So, Here's something a little bit more controversial. So 
So Lewis is taking each causal law to be a regularity in a system which best balances strength and simplicity. Here's how he puts it. Uh, such, a, such a system must be as simple in axiomatization as it can be without sacrificing too much information content. And it must have as much information content as it can have without sacrificing too much simplicity. And it's only regularities in that system that count as laws. One thing that's quite good here is that you can see that the abductive considerations are kind of baked into the account of law, which is kind of quite nice, especially if you're like me concerned about art metaphysics's kind of neglect of, of essentially the strength and simplicity considerations, uh, the abductive virtues. Okay, but the problem with that account, um, one system can be given different degrees of simplicity because of just how it's formulated. Okay, so here's, here's kind of Lewis's kind of problem. Given strong as you like system S, let F be a predicate that applies to all and only things at worlds where S holds. Take F as primitive and axiomatize S by the single axiom all X FX. Very simple theory, really nice, but it obviously looks like a cheat, right? Um, and Lewis's solution here to rule out this sort of cheating is just to forbid perverse primitive vocabulary. So here's his kind of line. Um, we should compare candidate systems uh, in simplicity only when they are formulated in the simplest eligible way. An appropriate standard of eligibility is not far to seek. Let the primitive vocabulary, oh, um, yeah, I mean, the basic idea, sorry, I've, I've mistyped that, but the idea is that the primitive vocabulary has to be stated in terms of perfectly natural properties. Okay, and here, just, just, just as a little thing to note, naturalness here is connected with another term, eligibility. So when he's moving between the properties themselves and this sort of slightly more semantic stuff, he talks about eligibility for, for reference, essentially. Okay. okay, so with the art case, I wanna draw another sort of parallel here. Um, I don't really have I don't really have a kind of great argument. I just think there's some considerations that I think this sort of looks persuasive that that lawhood is involved in art in some way. Um, definitely, it's going to be less general, less exact, but it looks like um, artistic practices and, and explanatory art inquiries operate with some law-like generalizations. So I'm going to sort of bracket. I'm not going to sort of talk about the artistic exploitation of scientific laws, which is going to be important in say oil painting or photography, things like that. Um, I just think there's a kind of no miracles argument from artist success in manipulating artistic mediums to produce artistic and aesthetic results. Um, and I'm gonna say that whatever law-like regularities are exploited in art an art inquiry, they should be distinguished from accidental correlations and lawhood shouldn't be a matter of linguistic choice. Right, which which are going to be the most basic ones, should probably have a kind of at least if you're a Lewisian should have an objective basis or a singular basis. Um, and again, I think a Lewisian art realist can uh, appeal to somewhat naturalness. Okay, I'm going to leave the side. I can sit. We can talk about cheapening complexity later if anyone's interested. Okay, so now we're we're moving on from the the metaphysical kind of bit to the epistemology. I'm going to look at um, induction and groove. This is actually going to be a little bit like laws. They, they seem to be kind of quite symmetric. But so here's a disarmingly um, naive quote from Ted Sider, which I really like. So he sort of says, here's why he thinks that we need naturalness. Or for him, it's the notion of structure. But, but for now, we'll just talk about naturalness. Um, the simplest model of learning from experience is that we remember past experiences. We expect the future to be like the past. And so we form appropriate expectations about the future. Yet any possible future is like the past along some dimension of similarity. So we can see the sort of similarity issue turning up again here in this formulation. I mean, and here's, here's Goodman's riddle. Goodman's sort of new riddle of induction brings this out. So let's imagine we finished observing all of the emeralds and they were all observed to be green, right? Looks like we've got really good evidence for accepting that all emeralds are green. It's an unusually good kind of case, right? But if this is so, unless we can restrict which predicates project inductively, it looks like we also have really good evidence for um, H starred, uh, all emeralds are grew, where grew denotes the abundant property is green if observed before 3000 AD or blue thereafter, right? Or but blue thereafter. Again, it's the cook upableness of predicates that seems to kind of generate this sort of issue. 
Um, now, Goodman has a sort of theory, says that some project well, some don't. And it, you know, for, for, for Goodman, it's kind of much more about shared culture and maybe shared biology and so on and so forth. But Lewis wants a sort of more realistic account. He wants something fundamental that's kind of almost forcing us to, to project correctly. Um, and for him, it has a metaphysical basis in naturalness. He just thinks natural properties project better, right? Okay. Um, so um, with induction and art, um, I think the case is a little bit like laws again, right? It's going to be sort of something like a no miracles argument. Although we don't say things like confirmation by induction, I think learning from experience is probably something that's quite central to the arts, and something that's kind of taken as a, as a given. And it would be sort of torpedoed if, if we were using gruesome predicates all the time to, to learn. Um, and I think, I mean, here's a few sort of throwaway guesses, right? So um, you can maybe see this in art practice. So the practical skills of color mixing, you know, artists are actually pretty good at sort of mixing colors after a while. Um, film development, so that takes kind of a while, um, and learning how to compose in functional harmony. You know, these are things that take a bit of practice, and there's probably a bit of induction going on. Um, I think in art appreciation, there's probably a subtle role here, which is to do with forming expectations. You know, given that the, the novel has been a kind of, seems to be a sort of, um, maybe it's a love triangle set in Victorian times, It'd be really weird if all of a sudden at the end you're going to get some postmodern kind of madness, right? Um, so I think informing expectations about any, like I say, any observed, unobserved parts it doesn't have to be in the future. It could just be a part that you can't see or something like that. And I think art inquiry, I sort of struggled a little bit more here, but I think when we're identifying authors of works or authentic means of performance or restoration, there's got to be quite a lot of induction going into those projects. Um, and again, I'm going to say that appeal to somewhat naturalness, um, somewhat projectability, looks like a live option for a Lewisian sort of art realist to take. I'm just going to say quickly, uh, one, one point aside a note about this approach to epistemology or inductive epistemology. It looks like the traditional aim of merely finding truths isn't enough for epistemological success on this sort of account. Some people might think that's a reductio of it, but I guess the thought is that all of those gruesome predicates, they still express truths. They're still used to express truths, right? It just seems that they're not doing a very good job of um, essentially carving the world in, you know, sorry, carving nature at its joints or carving reality at its joints. Um, and I think that, you know, whether we're taking our artistic joints to be sui generis or somehow, you know, um, somehow grounded in, in fundamental layer stuff, um, I still think that, that there's some sense of that carving, you know, a, a music analysts say will be trying to carve a work in its own terms, right? And so I guess that just seems like there's a bit of a precedent, but I'm not going to say too much about that because it gets... I think um, Ted Sider has a bit of a run in with Shamik Dasgupta about this, and it does start to get quite complicated. And I don't know which is the right way out, so I'll leave it. OK, um, this is probably the, 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 the toughest sort of cases here. So Lewis is a sort of interpretationist. He has an interpretationist metasemantics. So a metasemantics is it asks questions about how words or th thoughts may be attached to their reference. Um, so quite, I, I sort of used to shy away from the metasemantics literature because it sounded complicated. But it turns out that an undergraduate course about Kripkeon names, that's just a metasemantic theory. So um, this is mostly drawn from Williams 2007. Um, so he thinks, he sort of characterizes uh, Lewis, along with some other people, I think Davidson too, as adopting a sort of two-step interpretationism. So uh, what you do is you begin with states of the world in which sentences are rooted, and you give a recipe for extracting data in the form of a correlation with correlation of sentences with appropriate content. So they might be propositions or truth conditions or you know whatever. Now, for an expression to have a semantic property P is just for the for selected theories, the ones that match up with the data to ascribe that property to the word. The, the important thing for the inscrutability arguments we're going to look at in a moment is that on these accounts, what makes a, an interpretation correct is that it, it, it correctly uh, pairs states of the world with sentence level semantic entities, not subsentential entities. 
because what we're going to see is there's ways to uh, sort of shift to sort of shifty around the um, substantial elements and still get the same distribution of truth values and so on. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Um, so yeah, an inscrutability argument seeks to demonstrate that one can account for the patterns in linguistic usage by means of radically deviant assignments of lexical content or subsentential content. So these are often said to have their origins in sort of Wittgenstein on rule following. Um, so I think we're all probably familiar with uh, the Kripkenstein plus and quus sort of example. So the idea here is that um, you sort of think that you've been using addition all your life, you've been saying plus to mean addition, but there are sums that you've never calculated before. And there's nothing about your use that says that you're not using quus, which just said uh, that just for a number over a certain amount, it just delivers five for anything you put into it. Uh, but this, does that sound clear enough? Does that sound clear enough? I find these quite hard. Yeah, that looks sound okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing people have sort of know these ones anyway. Um, Again, uh, Lewis uh, in his 83, um, uh, he just adopts a naturalness response. He just says, hey, look, addition is more natural. So it's a more eligible um, candidate for reference than is uh, quaddition. Um, yeah, so now he, with the Wittgenstein, he's, I think this stuff is probably really interesting and a really fruitful source of information because, because it's about rule following and not just word application it seems like it's gonna have quite a lot of, you know, how, how this kind of metasemantic worry, you know, how do I know I'm performing Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, right? You know, maybe I'm performing something that's Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, but then after a certain time, it's something completely different, right? Who knows what, you know, my past, my past use hasn't really, you know, decided one over the other. But because the exegesis is so fraught and, um, you know, there's there's a lot of heavyweight kind of writers involved in this. I'm going to sort of drop those for now, but I do think they're, they're kind of important. But like I say, Lewis does have an answer here. Um, Quine from below. Um, this is one that kind of got a little bit torpedoed when I was sort of just over the weekend. Um, so I think we're sort of familiar with Gavagai. We all remember the sort of Gavagai cases, right? So the idea is we take a linguistic who's translating the utterances of an alien tribe into our own tongue. And we assume that the interpreter's got access to markers for ascent and descent. So that's like our correlates of the sort of sentence level entities, right? Well, now we're looking at Gavagai, which is a subsentential expression. Um, and it seems that the, the verbal behaviors of speakers of that language are equally well accounted for if their word Gavagai is translated as rabbit, rabbit stage, undetached rabbit part, low rabbits, rabbit hood is present, you know, all, there's all sorts of different variations. Um, and Quine then concludes that because of this, there's no fact of the matter over which of these entities Gavagai refers to. Um, I think, as, and as Van McGee puts it, he says, look, if that was all there was to Quine's argument, that would have just sort of been a curiosity, probably be neglected. But at the very end of the chapter, um, I think it's chapter two in Word and Object. Quine does a pirouette, as, as Van McGee describes it, and he just turns it back on ourselves. Why think that we're any more determinate in what we're referring to? Um, now, a lot of people sort of will reply to this by saying, well, Quine's behaviorism, his linguistic behaviorism is obviously, that's the thing to discharge here. But Van McGee makes, I think, a really good case. He says, okay, we dropped the behaviorism, we'll give you access to some more facts. Which ones actually help us get rabbit rather than undetached rabbit part or rabbit slice, right? Mental states, well, is there something it feels like to refer to one over the other? It's very hard to tell. Um, neurophysiology doesn't tell us what the state's about, right? Um, and I think, I think in the art case, I, I mean, this is a bit of a stretch, but it's whether, you know, so if we're looking at use internal, features of say people's use of, of artwork terms. Um, can looking at use internal facts for a given work tell us whether it's an individual, an event, a set, a trope, a property? Uh, and I would just say multiple artworks have been assigned to each. And there might just be a sort of question about whether we refer to any of them, whether our patterns of ascent and descent uh, can do that. 
Now, here's something that, 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 that hit me over the weekend. Um, Lewis doesn't apply a naturalness response here. I thought he did. I think it was just a mirage based on the fact that he seems to deploy naturalness on a load of other cases. Um, <clears throat> so here's one, one thing he says. Um, is that, yeah, OK, so, so in his, his uh, 75 paper, Language and Languages, he sort of says, we should regard with suspicion any method that purports to settle objectively whether Gavagai is true of temporally continuant rabbits or time slices thereof. And uh, later in 84 and Putnam's Paradox, he says rabbit stages, undetached rabbit parts and rabbit fusions seem only a little, if any, less eligible than rabbits themselves. Kind of puzzling, right? I was kind of puzzled by this. Now, on the one hand, it could be that the Gavagai case doesn't matter, right? It could be that he's thinking about a sort of a standoff with, um, he's thinking of a standoff with a causal theorist, someone who takes a causal account and they can they can maybe get subsentential expressions, but it turns out from below doesn't help them either. So he might have left it for that reason. But I also had like a minor suspicion where I was looking at the sort of, when he talked about rabbit stages, uh, and rabbit fusions and things. One thing I started to get a little bit suspicious about was whether, given that he's quite charitable to ordinary use, whether he might worry that his four-dimensionalism, so he's a four-dimensionalist about material objects, that is gonna involve the semantic claim that when we refer to rabbits, we do refer to rabbit slice fusions, or in Ted Sider's variation that we refer to rabbit slices. And, you know, interestingly, Lewis thinks that a temporal slice of a person is a person and it bears lots of properties that a person does. So I'm just wondering if he's left that alone. There's a start, given that, that Quine's his supervisor and he's kind of followed up lots of other Quinean themes, there's a real sort of lack of discussion of the Gavagai example in Lewis. So just something I noticed, a curiosity. Maybe torpedo is my thing, but, I mean, you know, I'm thinking that if, 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 if rabbit stages are, say, just slightly less eligible, that should make the difference, right? If they the use factor all the same. So yes, yeah, so I don't know where to sort of leave that. Um, now, finally, these are the hard ones, right? I'm not, and I'm not gonna give you like a full permutation argument because they kind of, they involve stuff from model theory that I don't really understand. But we can get a sort of a real kind of basic feel from, um, this is from Robbie Williams 2007 presentation, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so we've got this idea of the intended reference for Primavera, the painting, right? And we've got the intended reference for red square. And that the intended reference function, we think, takes Primavera to Primavera, takes red square to red square. Um, that's what we're thinking of as our reference relation. But remember, all we're trying to do is preserve truth value distribution, right? So here's a way, can we come up with an assignment that's gonna sort of mix those two up? So it takes Primavera to red square and red square to Primavera. Um, advocates of permutation arguments think there are. These start, these start out, I think, in um, Putnam's 1980, maybe. Um, and actually, Putnam, in Putnam's 1980, he actually gives a precedent for these from 1922, a paper by Scholem. Um, just, you know, it might be perceived the Wittgenstein case of, a, of an inscrutability argument, but sort of some historical interest. Um, so, okay, so we've got this kind of deviant reference function. Um, but we can, re we can recover the truth values that we, we, we got with our intended interpretation. So here's what we do. We take the image of X, this term to pick out X whenever X is neither primavera or red square. So in our case, if we're not talking about primavera or red square, just leave, just business as usual. Um, but pick out, pick out primavera whenever X is red square and pick out red square whenever X is primavera, right? So now we've got a kind of a deviant reference function. Name n refers star to x, just when x intendedly refers to y and x is the image of y. So the output of that function. Obviously, we could run indiscernibility of identicals arguments and go, but look, red square is square, primavera isn't. So what we have to do now is make a second compensatory twist at the level of predicate application. Okay, so applicate, on an application starred understanding, um, any predicate p, P applies starred to X, if and only if P standardly applies to some Y, such that X is the image of Y. Uh, sorry, yeah, that's it. Sorry, such that X is the image of Y, it's that simple, right? Um, so the twists cancel out and we get coincident distributions of truth values. 
and Putnam's 81, Appendix 1, uh, Williams 2005, his PhD thesis, um, they do some work in, in just extending that. That's, that's, that's preserving truth values. You might want truth conditions and counterfactual claims and so on and so forth. They've got ways of doing that. So they claim, I can't verify it, but, but yeah. Okay. Um, so again, the Orthodox Lewisian is gonna uh, appeal to naturalness here, right? Um, since the deviant interpretation piggybacks on the intended interpretation, it's gonna be less natural. And it's going to provide less eligible semantic values for primavera red square, so we can rest assured that primavera does refer to primavera. Um, though I would say there's a little bit of complication. Uh, Williams, uh, in developing this, comes up with a way to reprise it, uh, where your sentences that seem to be about the world seem actually refer to Henkin models in Henkin sentences or something like that, which are especially distinguished. Um, and then Weatherson adopts a sort of non-orthodox reading that gets around that. And I, I'm not really up with that stuff yet. So I'm not gonna to say too much. I'm just gonna kind of get the basic, uh, the basic sort of dialectic in place. Okay. Um, there are lots of implications for our metaphysics. Just the idea that there's a use external constraint is gonna have a massive impact, I would have thought, on how we go about finding out maybe what our terms mean, you know, what concepts mean, and also which, which things are the best candidates for being an artwork or for having balance or symmetry or whatever. Um, but unfortunately with this, because there was so much literature, um, by the time I got back round to doing the implications bit, I'd forgotten about all the things I'd thought about before. But I've got two, a couple of kind of, I think, important uh, places. So So, so basically the chief source of evidence, as I mentioned in the, the, the preamble, um, the chief, chief source of evidence for philosophical conclusions about art comes from use internal facts. And in fact, doubly internalistic because they, they often don't even take into account a sort of environment externalism or social externalism that Putnam and Burge um, argued for. But these are even worse because these are use external, these are completely use external. Um, I think there are some views that have sort of become quite popular but they've become popular because of how well they mesh with use, even though they seem to be cast in extremely unnatural terms. So um, contextualist accounts of uh, multiple artwork identity, uh, accounts like Levinson's 1980, where on the right-hand side of your identity criteria, you've got appeals to, um, well, in, 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 the, in the eventual worked out version of Levinson, you've got appeals to context identity, where contexts are just nuts. It's just like anything that's ever happened. And it's really hard to, you know, and I, when I was doing this as a grad student, I was thinking, I'd rather take art, I'd rather take musical work, right, as a primitive and define context in terms of those. I really don't have much of a handle on, on context identity. Another sort of view is uh, response dependent accounts of aesthetic properties. So I appreciate they are, there's a really sort of sophisticated body of literature about this, I don't understand, but I've always just sort of looked at them and thought, they, they sound misexplanatory. I think they, they're the wrong way round. I think you should probably try and work out what the response is by appeal to what the property is that it's responsive to, not the other way round. And I mean, I've got a sort of, here's a thought, right? So. What you could do is you could take a sort of given, say you, you could take the, the aesthetic predicate unified, right? You know, a few, this view, um, well-tempered clavier is unified, right? It's a unified sort of work. Um, it has certain balance, certain symmetries to it. And here's the thought. Um, you could have a version of, you could have a, you could have a response dependent version where when our responses give out, there's just, no, you know, things wouldn't have the property, right? Um, or you could have a version that just extends off to infinity. So suppose you take well-tempered clavier and scale it up. You just double it, just double how long it takes. I think there are gonna be aesthetic properties that are gonna be preserved in that. Or take um, Piero de Francesco's Baptism of Christ. This is kind of a painting with the, the Christ in the center. I think John's in it. And there's a dove above the head, the hands are clasped in supplication at the bottom. And people say it's a balanced painting. I think you can make that really, really big, really, really small and preserve the balance. Or at any rate, there's an interpretation, there's a reading of balance 
which I think is more eligible for reference natural, you know, naturally. On the response dependence account, it seems like it just arbitrarily cuts out somewhere where responses are going to give out. That just seems like an unnatural property. To um, and also, I'd, yeah, I'd, say I'd extend that to say things like uh, qualitative transpositions. So take well-tempered clavier, make it so high pitched we can't hear it. I think I think it's still got you know some aesthetic properties there. Or color, you know, color trans. Uh, Color transpositions, color inversions, you might preserve. There are going to be the more natural ones will be the ones that probably project through more cases. Um, <clears throat> and I think there's also a parallel for definitions of art. So definitions of art got increasingly complicated. I think there's sort of like there's a bibliography that, that Dom Lopez mentions from 2008, and there's 400 different sort of competing views about definitions of art. And they are, as far as I'm aware, largely use internalist. The, the, the whole methodology for them is use internalist. And what I would say is just, I mean, a bit of a sort of speculative parallel. The only place elsewhere in philosophy where people don't go, oh, that is an art according to my definition. Why is that? Where people just start brute forcing it by throwing more kind of accounts is in the Getia literature. And that literature is weird. It's really unusual, right? It's an unusual body of literature. And it took a long time for, I think, maybe Tim Williamson to sort of point out that it might be a bit of a waste of time. Um, <laughs> well, not a waste of time, but um, it might be an unproductive way of, of uh, addressing an inquiry. Um, so that, that's it, really. Um, that's, that's the end of it. There, there probably are more implications that I've forgotten about, but, um, but yeah, I'd be, I'd be really glad to sort of hear where I've gone wrong before I waste the next six months of my life trying to write this up. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs>